or bust. Your home for all things crypto at Benzinga. My name is Logan and I am joined by Ryan. How are you today? Doing well. Happy Friday, Logan. Happy Friday indeed. How do we have zero? Okay. 72 viewers, a lot better than zero. Looks like we got some people watching the stream now. Shall we go right into it? Talk about some bear market strategies. Look at coin market cap. We got a lot to go over. We have an interview at 2.30 p.m. with Flix, bringing Hollywood to the blockchain. Some old heads from Hollywood are now creating a cryptocurrency and financing streaming. Should be pretty interesting. That's coming up at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, so definitely stay tuned. And we can't forget about our sponsor of Moon or Bus slogan, FTX. If you guys are still paying fees on your crypto trading platform, what are you doing? Use FTX.us. Do we have a link in the description? Is that how we're doing it now? We used to send it in the chat. We used to just say FTX US, uh, but we have a special link now. So let's use that. They might get a bonus. I'm not sure. No promises, but it's basically a bonus when you're saving on fees. Uh, so definitely check out FTX.us. Link in the description below. Save some money. It's a bear market. You know, it could always save a few bucks here and there, uh, but let's check out some charts maybe. All right, I'm gonna have to pull them up today. I am on my iPad, so I'm not really sure uh, how I can make this work. I can give it a shot. Nope, it says unable to screen share. Uh, so we're riding on you for the charts today, but uh, I've been following the prices a little bit. See, ApeCoin's almost back at $5. Ether's at over 1200 Bitcoin Why do you think that is? I saw on the sign outside after I got Shake Shack today, I saw Ethereum was up like 15% and Bitcoin was up like 3%. So Ethereum's outperforming right now. I think it might be because of the, the Robinhood listing Uniswap to a small degree because that shows that some applications on Ethereum aren't securities. At least that's how I took it. I took it as there's probably some regulatory clarity with Uniswap, and that's why Robinhood finally listed the asset. Uh, maybe it's just a coincidence. I don't really know. They didn't say anything, but that's what I took from that news. Yeah, I thought that news was really significant as well. I don't know if you saw, but I made a TikTok about it at 0x Logan and also make sure to follow me there. But uh, I actually got two notifications almost back to back. One was the Robinhood added Uniswap, and the other notification was a signal from the Federal Reserve from Blinken that uh, that de decentralized finance may come to be more significant, more powerful, uh, and, and that Uniswap news as well um, did convince me. Maybe I didn't I didn't think about the security angle. But I think you make a good, a good point there. Remember when the rumors were going around like a year ago that Robinhood was going to integrate Uniswap into their platform? Mm -hmm. You think that's a possibility now? Is that back on the table? Maybe. I, I don't see the business case for it, though. Why would they do that? I guess just to offer access and make it easy. Maybe. I could see it. They could probably charge like a fee on top, right? Because Uniswap has thousands of assets listed. So maybe you go through, you go through Robinhood for it and then they just charge a fee. Definitely a way that they could do it. Uh, they could also offer the coins themselves, but there's going to be a lot of you know, regulatory risk. Hey, why are you listing this coin? Why are you listing that coin? If it's decentralized, they just plug in Uniswap, and they can let it rip, and they can block the ones that they don't want people accessing. Um, I think that would be a good and safe and easy route for them to take. Uh, how are we looking on those charts, right? Well, I'm in here. I can share my screen. Let's pull up Bitcoin. Just give me a second. Not super used to this. Not the best producer, as you guys know, Yo, especially the long-term viewers. Comments out there, the mic levels are whack. You could check it, uh, check it out for, for us. Us. Apparently, my volume is low. Uh, that'd be, thank you. Much appreciated. Let us know in the chat if that is better, guys, because we have no clue out here. Also, make sure to let us know what you're trading, what you're looking at, and how you're feeling on this lovely Friday afternoon. Uh, Ryan, I see your screen, uh, but it doesn't have, I think you shared. I the, might have shared the wrong one. I think you shared the restream. Oh, all right. The audio is better. Thank you, producer Rohan. There we go. Let's pull it up. Uh, I guess that's my job, huh? I can get it. Oh, dope. Boom. Okay, so here we have the Bitcoin weekly candlestick charts, and I drew these lines a few months ago uh, when we went down into this range, and it looks like 
maybe it's holding you know we had a few candlesticks go below it but now we are above again and that's right about twenty thousand dollars so our previous all-time highs from the end of 2017 and you know we could be traveling in this channel for a while i think everyone kind of agrees at this point we definitely are in a bear market we've been going down now for eight months so the question is how do you play this bear market to be prepared for the next bull market i mean i think we have a long time to go we have the ethereum merge coming up they're saying now it's going to be mid to late September. That's the closest we've got to a finite date. Usually they said, at first they said uh, at the beginning of the year, it's going to be summer 2022. And then they said August 2022. And now they're saying mid to late September. So we're getting closer and closer to a finite date. It probably won't actually be a date. It'll be a block on Ethereum. But with that, we can guess right around what time it's coming out. I'm hoping that gives us some upward price momentum with Ethereum and maybe that'll pull us out or at least give us some relief in the short term. Uh, but I mean, with all the macroeconomic stuff going on right now, it's hard for me to believe we'll see all-time highs this year. Uh, but we have all the time in the world to prepare for the next bull market, it seems, right? So let's talk maybe about some strategies, how to prepare yourself for the next crypto bull market, because one thing is for sure, crypto is here to stay. And we can see by zooming out, I mean, we've had some terrible, terrible bear markets in the past where crypto as a whole has lost about 90% of its value and Bitcoin uh, a little bit less since it's, you know, the most established cryptocurrency out there. Uh, but I mean, check out this chart, right? We've gone down 80, 90% back in 2015. We saw probably an 80% dip back in 2013. We saw 85% dip in 2018. So I don't think this is going to be any different. There just giving us some more time to prepare before we see new all-time highs down the road. Yeah, Ryan, I agree with you there. This uh, certainly doesn't seem like the end of crypto, in my opinion, especially when you put it on this log chart or the the non-log chart. Which one is this? This is log. Okay. Got the log chart here. We, we zoom out. It's up only. And this, you couldn't even see if it wasn't a log chart, right? Because the gains over the past year have been way too big. The gains in 2017 were way too big. So all of this essentially just looks like a flat line if it's not a log chart. That's why we use it to show you guys the trend with exponential growth because you can't really see these price movements from 2012 till 2017 on a normal chart because the gains over the past couple of years have been so large. We got Lord Byron out here in the chat saying he needs to buy a big bag of Polygon. Ryan, if you give us an overview, we haven't talked about fundamentals in a while. What is what is Polygon? What yeah. is scaling? You Polygon like Polygon? Dope. Yeah, Polygon is an application on Ethereum. It's a side chain that you can use to get around high gas fees, often referred to as a layer two. But the Polygon out right now is a side chain. I guess you could call it a layer two, uh, but a more true layer two using ZK proofs is coming out with Polygon. Uh, something that people may not realize is Polygon's actually releasing five different chains. I think some of them might be application specific, but I know they're messing around with a lot of different technologies to find the best way to scale Ethereum. And Polygon Hermes is coming out soon. If it hasn't already launched, I haven't been keeping up with it. Do you know if it's been mm. launched? I do not know. Uh, if not, I can take it's a quick coming look, out though. soon for sure. Yeah, fact check me on that one. But we have a reporter actually going to ETHCC next week, Europe's biggest conference for Ethereum, and Polygon Hermes will have some big news there. He'll be interviewing the team. I'm really excited for that. I mean, I wish I could go, uh, but London is far away. Luckily, he is in Europe for the summer. Uh, so stay tuned on Benzinga.com. We will have some fire interviews coming out from ETHCC. I mean, there's huge names there. We got Gitcoin, which we've interviewed at some other conferences before. We got Aave, we got Uniswap, we got all the big protocols at ETHCC. So I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. All right, Ryan, I'm doing some research into the Hermes uh, chain and I can't see exactly if it's open, but what I did read that I was unaware of is that there's a separate token for it. Hmm. The H-E-Z token. Uh, after Hermes Network merged with Polygon, the HEZ token has been indexed to Matic token. Polygon's native token Matic will become the utility token of the Polygon Hermes ZK rollup. Okay, so I guess HEZ was an old token that you can now swap into Matic. So no airdrop. You got me excited for a second. <laughs> Unfortunately, no airdrop. Okay. Uh, that is a, an outdated token, I guess. Uh, but this is uh, maybe maybe out, maybe public. It's a good question. Let's we'll try it. Logan, I pulled up the ETH chart on the stream here. A little bit small, uh, but I can see it here on my laptop. I thought we were up a lot more 
Uh, but after looking at the one day candlesticks, it looks like we are range bound right now between mm -hmm. about twelve hundred fifty dollars and what looks like around a thousand dollars. Um, so I'm not buying here. I thought there was more upside that got me excited, but zooming out, seeing the trend, I mean, we are just range bound right now and mm -hmm. we have seen a huge downtrend uh, since around April now. Um, so I'm not buying here, but I did buy some at $900. And if we go down below $900, I'll be prepared to scoop some more up. Yeah, I've been noticing this range as well. We've been bouncing back and forth between, if this is the Ether chart, at like $1,000 and $1,200. Um, I wonder how long we're going to be inside of this channel. It could be a lot longer than I hope and I want. Um, but Ryan, what's your take? How long do you think the market's going to have to go sideways before we can see another move to the up or down side? No, I have no idea. Like I say, I don't have a crystal ball. And even if I did have a crystal ball, I don't know how to use a crystal oh, ball. Shoot. So I don't really know. Um, but what I will say is we probably will either see downside pretty quickly. And by that, I mean within the next month, we'll see another leg down or we'll be range bound. Right. So either we go down from here, maybe to eight hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars, or we stay range bound. And maybe that the bottom was at around nine hundred dollars when we saw three AC go bankrupt and Zeus Sue run away. Oh, Logan, I made really cool mugs today. We need to show them on the stream. Did you see them? I tagged you on Slack. No, I did um, not see it yet, but okay. I accidentally canceled your screen share. You're going to need to rip it one more time. OK, um, perfect. While you're pulling that up, I want to dropped to a comment that Lord Byron said he was talking about the Disney news. I'm not sure if you saw this, but Disney selected Polygon to be their blockchain of choice going forward for their uh, quote unquote accelerator program. I think this is huge, huge news. Um, you know, we've seen all of the, the blue chip integrations with Polygon and yet another from Walt Disney himself. The man, the myth, the legend is a Matic Bull. <laughs> Walt Disney, is he still alive? Nope, he's not. Um, rest in peace to okay. the bro. Disney using Polygon, that's pretty big news. But Logan, let me one-up you. I have bigger news. I just shared my screen. But Benzinga just launched some it. crazy, crazy swag. Uh, it should It's showing for me, Logan. I don't know why it's not showing for you. Uh, let, me, let me try again really quickly here. Crypto accessories. It's huge news, guys. Stay tuned. No, it's oh. Not, it's not working. Oh. This is where I've been. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, go if you're interested to swag.benzinga.com under crypto accessories. I'll try and share my screen. Can you drop the link for us? I can drop the link. We'll send it in the chat, guys. Check them out really quickly because you're going to want to drink coffee out of these things. Let me tell you, <laughs> these are the coolest mugs since 1987 <laughs> when the second coolest mug came out. You see them, Logan? Yeah. Okay, so we made mugs today. They're Zoo Sue mugs, guys. The founder of 3AC, who has since ran away. He's in hiding somewhere with about $100 million. Uh, but we have two cool mugs with some tweets from Zeus too. So the first one says, and this is by Zeus you guys, feeling cute, might withdraw a few hundred K ETH. So that, that's nice to drink your coffee out of in the morning. We have another one. This one's my personal favorite. Zeus you tweet, he says, life is short, go long to hedge. <laughs> <laughs> oh that man. That did not work out for him. You know, we should have seen it coming. We really should have. That's, uh, that's like the Do Kwan tweet that I quote tweeted, like he, he put it out like five days before the collapse. And he said, you know what? Maybe we deserve negative 188%. <laughs> uh, we need a collection of these mugs. We need to get some from, Zoo well, we have some from Zusu, but we need some from Do Kwan. We need some from Alex Mashinsky. Uh, I heard rumors that Nexo might be going insolvent. That might be concerning to some. I don't have any assets on Nexo. Uh, but did you see that on Twitter, Logan? I did not see that. Okay, I will, what do you think I the will significance debrief, would be? I will debrief you guys on it. So now if you pull out assets on Nexo, they will send you an email saying, hey, we really want you to keep your assets on the exchange. <laughs> and to do so, if you just lock it up for one more month, we'll give you extra APY. 
that, well, that's, that's sus. That's sus, right? Super sus. Like all of these rumors are going around about all these different exchanges becoming insolvent. And then you start sending emails out saying, please, please, please don't pull off your crypto from our exchange. What do you think retail investors are going to think when they get that email? I mean, if I got that email, I would say, hell no, I don't want an extra 2%. I want my money back now. It sounds like you guys have some insolvency problems. Uh, now that's circulating around on Twitter. I bet a lot of people will be pulling out from Nexo. So this might be a self-fulfilling prophecy, <laughs> which is kind of unfortunate. Man, like I, if I saw that, I would pull all my stuff out right away. You know, like we've seen enough extra APYs to last us forever. I don't know. I think that we all learned that extra APY is uh, the secret to get the money from our pockets into their pockets. <laughs> That's about it. That's why you need to know where your interest is coming from. And that's the beauty of DeFi and these different dApps like MakerDAO and like Aave that you can see everything happening on chain. You see the liquidation prices. You know exactly what your risk is if you can look on the actual blockchain and see where everyone's position is. Oh, it's much, much more transparent than using a centralized platform like Celsius or like BlockFi, where maybe they do boost up those APYs to get more users on the platform. And then you ask yourself, you know, how do they get this extra interest sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but when it doesn't work that can end super poorly for the investors putting their money on that platform yeah and so i, I mean we've seen a few consolidations come in with these insolvencies sbf binance uh trying to buy up these companies the people that kept their liquidity around and didn't lend it out irresponsibly during the bull market are now the, going to be the winners of this bear market. Um, Ryan, what do you take from these consolidation trends, these announcements? Uh, I think it's probably a pretty good thing overall, um, but you know, the big players are just getting bigger now. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. The big players are getting bigger, but they're the smart players in the market, right? They're not going Clearly. leverage long. They're not risking user funds. So the people who played it safe through the bull market are now surviving and they can accumulate maybe more platforms and make these acquisitions, which ultimately I think is a good thing for the crypto markets. Yeah, Ryan, I agree with you there. It's a good sign to see that there are still people uh, with solvency out there and that they're the ones who are going to be uh, you know, taking the reins from the irresponsible folks that were out there, um, shaking out the weak hands. How, how many more weak hands do you think there are to shake out? Probably like four to six. <laughs> There's not many. I mean, we're are down. Those pairs of hands or individual hands? Um, probably pairs of hands. Yeah, probably okay. like four to six people, eight okay. to twelve hands. Okay, and are these CEOs or just retailers? Retailers. CEOs. Retailers. They can't sell Bitcoin as fast unless it's their personal holdings. Okay, so we're close to the bottom. But there's about four to six hands that are left to be shaken. <laughs> uh, hopefully they don't have dogs. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Logan. So, yeah. I know you're a huge ENS fan. I'm wondering, yeah. have you seen some of these big sales happening recently? Uh, I saw 000.eth sold like last week for 300 ETH. Um, but what, what else did I miss? Okay, so yeah, let's start with the numbers. The numbers are going crazy. I've been browsing some of these ENS sales. For those of you who might not be familiar with ENS domains, they're your domain name for crypto. You can attach it to your crypto wallet, make a website, basically your handle for Web3. So mine's RyanM.eth. You can see that on Twitter. Logan has a bunch of different ENS domains. I think his main is getmoney.eth. Um, hopefully I didn't expose you there, Logan, but there've been tons and tons of ENS sales. First off, these numbers. I understand it. You can only have one 000.eth and that's like the number one right and there's already precedents for like this number collecting where you can only have one like in mm -hmm. dubai there's like the license plates and, right. and the prince has one as his license plate and, and i've seen like seven sold for some crazy amount tens of millions of dollars so i completely understand why people are going after especially these three digit ens domain names and now four digit ens domain names they weren't even sold out a couple months ago people were picking up tons of these four digit ens domain names and now they're selling for uh, the floor is like one and a half two ETH, right? So people are getting $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 for these four digit ENS domain names. And a lot of collectors like these because they have other NFTs. So if you have board ape number 5468, maybe you want 5468.eth. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I kind of understand that, but it's getting, in my opinion, a little bit ridiculous, especially with the five and six number, six digit ENS domain names. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. It might be hype, but I could see over the long term, I mean, there's some value in that, right? You can remember it super easily, like a phone number, even better when it's five or six digits. Uh, but what's more interesting, there's a new trend with ENS domain names. People are making 50, 60, $70,000 from some of these sales. 
And these are brand name ENS domains. So Hermes.e sold today for 60 really? Ethereum, $60,000. Huh. We had Samsung.e sell for, I think, 40, 50 Ethereum a couple days ago. Bullish. And we had Starbucks.e also sell for five to six figures. Not so, sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> Not sponsored by Starbucks. But we are sponsored by FTX, so go check them out. Um, Ryan, that's that's crazy. I didn't know Hermes sold. Uh, I didn't know that Samsung sold. Uh, that is a really good sign. Um, and you know, I've had this, this thought occur to me before, mostly because all my other bags are worthless, but what if ENS is the biggest bag of all? What if that's the best play? We've been talking about it for over a year, probably. I think definitely over a year mm -hmm. at this point. We watched the airdrop happen. We watched the token dump. <laughs> and now we're seeing all these big sales during a bear market. I mean, ENS probably has more volume than a lot of these other projects right now, on a, especially on a day like today when we have some of these big brand names selling. Uh, I might have to go check my wallet, go try to relist some of them, stack some ETH. But yeah, I, I really like ENS domains. I think that there's a huge use case for them, uh, particularly when it comes to the subdomains, right? So we, we already heard from Coinbase that they're going to be issuing all of their users, uh, you know, their free subdomain. They're working on an Ethereum improvement proposal that will allow uh, the ENS subdomains to be routed through, a, you know, a centralized party. This way, Coinbase eth you know you send it to ryan.coinbase.eth and, Co and coinbase is able to uh you know route it to ryan right they don't have to pay doesn't have to be on chain um so this is really going to scale the readability the usability of these addresses and the adoption of these addresses uh, i think that the ethereum name service is a pretty big no-brainer um when it comes to you know function when it comes to making ethereum more user-friendly and more adoptable. Yeah, I really like this news about Coinbase because now all of a sudden there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people that have some type of .eth domain name. They'll know how to use it. And we said the same thing about Coinbase NFT and then look how that turned out. <laughs> so let's be a little bit wary here about the subdomains with .eth for Coinbase. But I think this will drive adoption further, especially when people realize that they need to hold custody of their own funds. So all these traders right now that are holding funds on Coinbase, eventually, at least I think, they'll transfer that out or at least the bulk of their funds off of an exchange if they're holding over the long term and into their own wallet that they own the private keys of and then do you really think that they're going to want to remember or copy and paste their ethereum address that's 64 digits long no no not at all especially when they already have a dot eth domain name with coinbase they'll be used to it they'll say well i have ryan.coinbase.eth now let me get ryan.eth for my other wallet that i hold the the private keys to yeah ryan i agree with you there and so does matthew Diab in the chat, ENS is genius. Uh, look at the current domain market. Domains sell for insane high profits, so this is a no-brainer. Especially the immutability, the non-fungibility, and the token. It's a token, man. It's way cooler than a domain. I saw I saw a funny tweet, I think yesterday or the day before, with like the Gigabrain guy, and it was a, a registry of what his, his ENS domain names, and it was iPhone 60, iPhone 61, iPhone 62, iPhone 63. <laughs> this dude is thinking 50 years in the future. I thought that was funny. That's pretty awesome. Uh, is there a use case for iPhone63.eth? Yeah, I mean, right now, if you have iPhone10.com and you have a blog about iPhones, that helps SEO and you can rank higher in the search positions. So I think that will be desirable. Uh, if Apple decides to make an iPhone 60, it might be like the iPhone Air by then or the iPhone Pro or like, who knows, maybe they'll use negative numbers instead <laughs> if they get too high. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, those guys at Apple love to get high. <laughs> I got it, guys. I got it. Let's do iPhone negative two. <laughs> this is innovation. Share price, $1,000. It's, it's what Steve Jobs wanted. I uh, just got to make Steve proud, man. <laughs> All right, Ryan, we have an interview today. Who are we going to be talking to? We are talking to Ben from Flix, a new era of financing movies on the blockchain. He's been involved. I believe it's him who helped out with Star Wars, a couple other really big shows. Uh, but we'll get his background in about five minutes when he comes on for the interview. We spent some time talking about ENS. We spent some time on Bitcoin. Went over ETH really briefly. Uh, so maybe let's touch on altcoins since this is a strategy for a bear market. I will say I'm not too interested in altcoins right now. Typically in a bear market, altcoins 
tokens underperform Ethereum and Bitcoin. Uh, so it's more of a bull market play, but maybe there's maybe there's some undervalued picks here. Uh, Logan, do you have your eyes on any altcoins? Uh, I know that we're both probably not buying right now, uh, mm-hmm. but is anything of interest to you? Yeah, I would look at the DeFi sector right now. I mean, we've been bullish on DeFi for two years. Uh, but DeFi has just been going down. These governance tokens uh, kind of maxed out their their potential audience, I think. Um, we're going to see a lot more people gain access to these DeFi tokens, just like we did yesterday when Robinhood listed Uniswap. This is going to add a bunch of new buyers into the market for these DeFi tokens. And when the regulatory clarity comes in, it's over. Institutions will be able to scoop them up. People with huge stakes will be able to scoop them up. Governance tokens might actually have some real value once there is more of an institutional demand for them, an institutional demand for the products as well. There has to, has to be a demand for the protocol for there to be demand for the governance token, obviously, right? Yep. So, right, Ryan, if we could back up for a second, what is a governance token? A governance token gives you voting rights on a protocol. Typically, it doesn't have any inherent value other than being able to decide the future of a protocol. Uh, So these applications on Ethereum, they're decentralized, so it's not a team making the decision for it. Instead, it's the people that own the tokens can vote on different proposals and then push them through for updates. Uh, Logan, I've been thinking over the past couple days about Uniswap. And I've thought of a bear case that's stuck in my mind, and I want to get your opinion on it, being that we both hold Uniswap. I mean, I've held Uniswap since the airdrop. I didn't get it. I was a couple days late to the airdrop, but I ended up picking it up right after for around $3, and I've been holding ever since. Uh, Basically lost all my gains, but that's okay. Now I have a bear case against them. So this is how it goes. Uniswap was the first AMM. AMM's an automated market maker, basically a very simple way to trade crypto using a very simple math function. The reason they do this instead of order books is because Ethereum's block size is too small and the throughput is too small to have these order books on the blockchain. So instead, they use a mathematical equation that balances out the pool with two crypto assets, and that's how you can trade on their decks. Right now, they have, I'm pretty sure, the most total volume, volume lock. They also do a ton of, of volume on their platform. But my question is, if Ethereum scales and layer twos take off, then why not have order books on DeFi? We're already seeing it on some other blockchains. Maybe AMMs will be obsolete in a couple of years. Can Uniswap adopt to that or adapt to that or no? That's a great question. So my initial reaction is uh, that I do think that the prevalence of order book DEXs on layer twos will be much greater, right? The, the use case for Uniswap is not there as much when you can have that order book. Um, but on mainnet, on Ethereum, we still can't, don't have space for it. So I think that Uniswap will still provide the high value safety exchange on mainnet. Um, but that is an interesting point that I hadn't really thought about too much. Um, and, and, you know, the whole idea of the reason for an automated market maker being the lack of space for an order book, uh, it's not something that I think people think about a lot. You know, they see, hey, you have this simple math function that allows me to swap. Um, you know, that's, you know, it does the job. You don't even think about what it's replacing, right? Uh, what do you think? No, I agree. And I think it's a valid concern. That's why I bring it up now. Uh, But at the same time, I I totally agree with you that the high value trades will stay on mainnet because it's the most trusted, most decentralized. If you're trading with millions of dollars, you want that extra security and that extra peace of mind. So I think there always will be a use case. But maybe, you know, that's already valued in. Uniswap's worth almost $5 billion. And that could be justified if all retail traders eventually trade on Uniswap, then it could be worth, you know, 10, 100 times that. But if they all, if retail goes to layer twos and you can use typical exchanges uh, on layer twos instead of an automated market maker, then maybe that value isn't there. And I'm not sure if that's really priced in. Yeah, that is a good question. And it's really hard to, to determine a fair value for these governance tokens. We've been talking about this forever. Um, but there is a lot of speculation that is what drives the value of these governance tokens, of Uniswap's governance token. Uh, I think that as more people discover what it is as they use it, um, they'll make uh, you know the quote unquote mistake of thinking that you know the governance token is like the the equity of Uniswap. I think that's what a lot of people thought when they were pretty new when DeFi was new two years ago. Um, regardless though, 
think that Uniswap is good tech. I like the team. I like the stonk. And they just uh, bought Gem XYZ too, which is interesting. That was controversial on Twitter. It's an NFT marketplace, so they're getting into NFTs Uniswap now. Uniswap did? Yeah, Uniswap did. Interesting. I it didn't might, hear that. It was definitely, it might have been Genie XYZ, mm -hmm. not Gem XYZ. It was one of the two, um, so don't quote me. But yeah, they're getting into NFTs now, which is kind of an interesting play. Uh, typically, we saw SushiSwap, its competitor, get into all these different facets of DeFi, but we saw Uniswap kind of stick to its roots and focus on its AMMs, making them as good as possible. Mm -hmm. But now they're expanding. Remember when Vitalik wrote that blog post about Uniswap becoming the de facto USD price oracle. Yeah, that was interesting. You think that's ever going to happen? I think they would have took action by now if they agreed with him, right? That was almost a year ago at this point. There was a lot of hype and they could have capitalized off the hype after that blog post, which they didn't do. And I don't think people are really talking about it anymore. Uh, but that is interesting. I, I found it really interesting when Vitalik posted that, uh, but I don't think they're going to move forward. We will have to see. Only time will tell. Ryan, we have one of our guests backstage. Is Ben? Micho is backstage. Micho is backstage. Is Ben joining as well? No, he uh, he had something come up. All right. In that case, without further ado, welcome Micho to Moon or Bust. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Doing, doing good. Doing well. Thank you. Are we saying that right? Is it is it Micho or Miko? Perfectly, and I appreciate it. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Uh, so yeah, if we could kick off with some background about you, um, your journey through life, through Hollywood into the web three space, that would be awesome. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm from, uh, Michigan originally. I live in Los Angeles now. Nice. I've, um, you know, went to, went to undergrad studying kind of political theory, thinking that I was going to be a lawyer like a lot of other people do. But I actually met my, um, co-founder and, and producing partner, Ben at, at college at Michigan state. We just started making movies. We weren't in any film programs when we started. Uh, we just got together and started making feature films and moved to Hollywood. And uh, that's where I uh, started working for a company called The Asylum that produces crazy B-movies. And in that role as head of development for them, I wrote the story of Sharknado, the first Sharknado mm -hmm. movie. And then, you know, that blew up and I oversaw the development of the, the next few uh, while I was there. And at a certain point, I left to start a production company with, with Ben. And um, over the years, we came up with this idea of, of uh, doing flicks. All right, I have to ask, where did the idea of Sharknado come from? So the, so Sci-Fi, the Sci-Fi channel, um, at the company that I worked for, we, we made a lot of these movies of the week with them. They came to us and said, okay, we want to we wanna do a movie with like sharks in a storm. And somebody had the idea, I think the director indirectly had the title Sharknado from another project. And then my role was to put the pieces together and write the actual story, uh, the treatment before the script. Um, so it's like a lot of people had a lot to do with it uh, as a team. Awesome. Yeah, I don't do well with scary movies, so I haven't <laughs> seen it yet. Uh, but if I get maybe Logan to watch it with me, I'll, I'll definitely check it out because I've seen it. I've seen it all around on on Twitter and everything. I mean, seems seems like a ridiculously fun movie. So uh, I I'll always definitely have to like, check that I out. I always feel like scary movies are wasted on people who watch scary movies because if you do watch <laughs> scary movies, it becomes, you know, it becomes like a heroin fix. Where like the first time, like I remember when I saw The Exorcist for the first time as a teenager. I was the whole movie I was like barely could watch. It was so scary. But then you get that experience enough times and then next thing you know, nothing scares you anymore. So I always I always want people in my life who don't watch horror movies, like, please just watch one with me. <laughs> but maybe you know, Logan can, can hold your hand through it. <laughs> no promises. So Micha, I'm I'm curious, how do you come up with the idea for Flix? Well, you know, it was a team kind of a team effort, but I, I was looking at um looking at the crypto market, which I'm sure we'll get into, and we're talking, you know, just late 2021, which was a great, a great time for, for tokens and NFTs. Um, a friend of mine, our one of our silent partners, because I should add that like Ben and I are the Hollywood side, but then there are crypto people that are part of it as well who aren't doxxed. Um, we are doxxed just as a way of saying to the community, both the, both the crypto community and the Hollywood community, like, we're not screwing around. We are serious about doing this. We're putting our names behind it. But one of the, one of our team members who 
isn't doxed um, had done really well in crypto. And he had connected me to a project in, um, in 2021, I think it was like August or September, called the Baby Ape Social Club. Uh, it was an NFT launch and it was one of these, you know, sort of similar to Bored Apes, but they have their own different spin on it. And they wanted me to come in and write a narrative around their NFT launch, which would give it, you know, more of a competitive advantage. Because you remember, you know, six months ago, it was like everybody had a new NFT coming out. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wrote a narrative for them that kind of was like a fictional universe for their baby ape characters. It's Dab Island, you know, shout out to Dab Island. Um, and so that thing launched, I can't remember anymore, but I think it was like early December 2021 and sold out within minutes. We all did really well on it. And I said to, to Ben and to the others, like, we've got to do something here because it was the, frankly, it was the, it was the easiest money I ever made in my life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially in Hollywood, screenwriters were used to, you know, you work for years on projects that never see the light of day. And that's like part of, that's part of the cost of doing business. Everybody knows, like, everybody's got a drawer full of un, unproduced scripts. And looking at the lay of the land, I thought, you know, what if you could actually get generate value not by finishing and completing and releasing a film which is very capital intensive what if you could generate value by simply starting to work on something and saying hey what do what do you guys here all think about what if we do this and then that will create a virtuous cycle of token you know price action revenue then you can use that to fund the film i felt like there was a model there um, also inspired a little bit by looking at what happened with um, the MRI, M MRI token, the Marshall Rog Rogan Inu, where they were able to create a real world utility that actually provided money to MMA fighters um, and, you know, created a virtuous cycle of, of token uh, um, uh, price action. So that's kind of all so the moving pieces. That's that's actually really interesting. I have a question about that. So Flix is actually a fork of the MRI token. Why do you choose to fork a token instead of build your own? Uh, that that question's for me because I'm the Hollywood guy. It's a little above my pay grade, but okay. uh, you know, I'm sure there's there's a good reason for that. I think it's just it's the the ease and simplicity of it. Uh, and can you I, explain yeah. uh, if you're familiar? Can you explain MRI token because I'm not familiar with it? So maybe that will give us some context to the different dynamics of the token. Yeah, I'll tell you what I know about the MRI token, which is that the concept is in MMA, and I'm not a big fight fan, but in MMA, like a lot of professional sports, you have a tier at the top, which makes a lot of money on endorsements and prize money and whatever. And then you have a bunch of amateurs down at the bottom. But then there's this fragile middle, which are people who do make a living doing fights, but it's like they're barely scraping by. So you know, they might be making 40, 50, $60,000 a year, which is not a lot of money when you have to pay for your travel, pay for your medical expenses. So MRI gives those guys, they a, a, a portion of the, if not all of the sell tax goes to struggling fighters who then in turn promote the token and it becomes this virtuous cycle. Um, so that's how, that's my understanding of how it works. Um, but, but yeah. Okay, yeah, I see how that applies to the film industry. And we have some more questions we'll get to. And I think that was really good context for that. Uh, but firstly, I want to know, what blockchain is Flix built on and why did you choose it? Um, it's built on the Ethereum chain. And I couldn't tell you why we chose it. It's another, like, I'm not the technical guy, so I don't I don't fully understand why it was chosen. But that's, that's as far as I'm Sure. Know. Yeah, no worries. So... On the website, it says that Flix is actually a completely new industry. It's not that you're revolutionizing the film industry, but you see it as a completely new industry. Uh, so in what ways is Flix different from the traditional film industry? Well, <clears throat> the biggest the biggest difference between the Flix, the dream, which is like the Flix ecosystem and a whole new way of doing things is that, I mean, it's a little bit of, you know, hyperbole, like it's still obviously entertainment industry is the entertainment industry, but sure. the structure of it is what we're trying to change. And in the traditional film industry, it's very capital intensive. So in order to get a green light, which might involve, you know, the expenditure of eight figures of money, you know, or even nine figures of money in some cases, you have to go through all kinds of gatekeepers. and their incentives 
you know, if you're one link in that chain, if you're the um, junior executive um, at a studio dealing with the junior development person at a production company, your incentives are more to cover your ass. They're not necessarily to like make things and make as many things as possible. Because there's so much riding on it. You don't want to be the one to have lost $10 million, $100 million. So it's an, it's an inherently conservative defensive system which privileges places like Netflix, which up until recently was sitting on a giant pool of money. So they were able to just buy up all the properties, push out all the little guys, do everything in a kind of a um, you know hegemonic way. Whereas with Flix and with Web3, it has the potential to give, basically we're democratizing film finance. And so if you think about like, Currently, there's only a handful of giant buckets of money that go into funding the film and television that we watch. So you've got you've got Netflix, you've got um, Warner, these giant conglomerates that that own studios and streaming platforms. So those are huge publicly traded shareholder corporations. Sometimes you have private equity, but that's still you know big big institutional investors, big piles of money. Whereas when you democratize filmmaking. There's no reason, like everyone in the world watches films. There's no reason why they aren't all micro investors in films as well. And so you can imagine a world where instead of just shelling out your $15 a month for Netflix, your whatever the average spend is per consumer, like let's say it's $100 a month. What if people were spending, instead of $100 a month just on consuming, what if they were also spending $100 a month on producing? And then some percentage of those people, you know, maybe they made $300 that month on a bet that they took on a project. So you can imagine a world in which it's a lot more micro transactions, small bets, little mm -hmm. bits of money pooled together into making things viable. It's a, it's a lot more efficient way to allocate capital. Um, so, so say that I invest in Ryan's movie here. How does he get the money back to me? Well, in the, in the Flix case, you're not, you're not directly investing in a movie. What you're doing is you're buying the token. And so once you buy the token, the price will rise or fall. And then when we sell the movie or even just sell the script or do anything that, that brings revenue into the project, we buy back the tokens and we burn the tokens. And then that makes it deflationary. So the value of the token mm. increases commensurate with the money that was put back into it. And frankly, part of the reason why we're doing it that way is that we can't, we're, this is not a security. So there is obviously the model of the stock market where you buy you buy stock in a company and, and things like that. That's not what this is because it's illegal to do that mm -hmm. without going through the SEC. So it's an indirect way that the token rises in value, but it's it's buying and burning. That's basically the answer to your question. Interesting. So could you walk us through the process for a creator to get their film funded using Flix? Yeah. So basically, you'd have to come pitch it to us. Um, with American Meme, which is kind of like the the partner corporation affiliated with Flix, not directly linked to Flix, but affiliated with it. So you would pitch us an idea. You could come up through the community and say, hey, I've got this great idea for something. And then we would talk. And if we liked the idea, we would we'd give you some money. If more importantly, the community liked the idea, we would put some money behind it. So the funding is really community driven. Do you think this has ramifications for up and coming actors? Because I know in the traditional markets, investors will say, you know, I need to have this huge actor in the movie because I know it will sell. Uh, whereas if the community really likes the, the movie being made, maybe that's not so much the case. Yeah. I mean, you could, and the beauty is it can go both ways. So you could have uh, a project where it doesn't necessarily need the star power because there's a fan base already generated in the community. Um, you know, frankly, our community is not very big right now because the market's been so terrible. Our price is low. And like everybody else, it's like we're just kind of hanging on right now during this, you know, crypto winter. But you can imagine a world in which, yeah, the community is big enough where you have a built in audience already and you don't need to mess around with casting a big name. But even if you do need to cast the name, we're going through this process now where we say to somebody like, hey, look, we can pay you. We can attach. We can do what's called a pay or play deal where you say, we're going to give you this salary now, um, or at least a, a, a portion of it. And if you agree to be in this movie, and then if it doesn't come together, then you can walk away. So having the cash 
to attach the talent is um, is key. And so that's that's in independent filmmaking. That's always been kind of the chicken or egg problem where you have, you know, if unless you're like I said earlier, unless you're one of these giant uh, corporations that can afford to just out, you know, spend a bunch of money and not see it back for 18 months. If you're a little guy or even a medium sized you know, production company, you have to be very careful about how you spend that money. But in this model, you gain credibility with the community just by making that deal, just by making that offer in the first place. So you can do it the same way they do it by attaching the talent, but now we've got the money to attach the talent. And we're, at, we're talking to talent as we speak. I wish I could say who we're talking to, but we're, we're in those conversations now. Definitely something to look forward to. So I read that Flix actually doesn't have any employees. So how is a movie made without any employees? Or is yeah, that not I mean, correct? Well, it's, it, is, it is correct that Flix is not a corporation. It does not have employees. It does not, it's not registered to pay taxes. But as American Meme, which we're affiliated with Flix, we, we do you know hire people all the time and, and pay people all the time. And so in any other company that we would partner with, it would be the same arrangement where the company that takes the Flix money would um, pay their people with that. Gotcha. So let's talk about your community. You mentioned it was small right now, uh, but are there any projects that have bubbled up yet? Yeah, we, we have a few that have bubbled up. Um, one that bubbled up is, and it's called uh, Josh Fight, and it is um, – the story of, you might have heard of this in the media, but there was a guy named Josh uh, who was, you know, during the pandemic, he was tired of seeing all of his, uh, you know, his name is Josh Lane. He's a random white guy from Arizona. And he went on Facebook and just messaged all the other people named Josh Lane and said, all right, fellas, I challenge you <laughs> a duel. And I'm mangling the details a little bit, but basically it's a, it's a tongue in cheek this, this, is, this is what really happened. It became this meme where it was like the Joshes were all going to have a battle to determine who the one true Josh was. Um, <laughs> Just use so blockchain. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You close the loop. Um, so that's, that's the one that we've – and we haven't like officially announced that yet. I'm telling you guys here. But um, that's the one that we've announced to the community. And then we have a couple more coming up in the next two months that we haven't announced and and Micha, last year we saw NFTs take over Hollywood. And being in the film industry, do you guys have any plans to integrate NFTs onto your platform? We don't have any short-term plans to do it because we're not. The, the thing about NFTs is like, as a, it's a you're in the collectible business. It's a little bit. Um, it's not. It's not totally germane to the actual making of, of films themselves. There have been a lot of different projects that have been announced. Um, I've yet to see, other than just like minting NFTs of pre-existing IP, I've yet to see like a really successful model. We really looked, we looked hard at an NFT model for a while, um, but it was kind of tricky to, to see how that worked. We do have a project that is technically using NFTs to announce soon, um, but they're not NFTs in the like artwork sense. They're gonna be more just like, uh, one-off um, tokens, but you know, it's something that we've thought about. But this is to us, we thought this was like a simpler way of doing things. You you mentioned you haven't seen a successful NFT model specifically for what? Uh, for for filmmaking, like a like okay. a web three approach to filmmaking that isn't just the equivalent of merchandising, because there's always been a successful merchandising um, aspect to filmmaking as an ancillary mm -hmm. i guess it, it, it's it's always an ancillary revenue stream and it, they haven't figured out how to make it core to mm -hmm. the business model if that makes sense right so micha i'm curious if you've heard of i think it's the glue horse factory we had them on the show last year and they are in the film industry they launched some nfts i'm not really sure mm -hmm. how they're doing right now i haven't kept up with the project they actually um, put out the show oh no I, way. yeah i watched it it was it was good that's cool that was with john oh, yeah, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of it but yeah, John Barinholtz was the one of the guys on the team there. It's called Glue Factory. Uh, Glue Factory Horse. Where is it? 
Here we go. Yeah, Glue Factory show. Um, had some big names, had some big celebrities, and they put out all these NFT horses, and then some of them became characters uh, in the show. But, you know, that was another team in Hollywood that was really, really bleeding edge trying to get into the NFT space. Uh, and despite the fact that they put together an incredible show, uh, nobody talks about it. Nobody really knows about it. So uh, I'm curious, Micho, what do you think is required or necessary for Web3 to become uh, you know, more of a user friendly or more more of a household recognized or at least the products that come out of it. Right. Um, how, how can we bridge the gap between new Web3 IPs and the traditional market? Um, that's a great question. And that's what keeps me up at night these days. <laughs> in, in the um, and I think there's it's two things. One is it's got to be easy for dummies like me to buy the tokens and the NFTs like that. It's too hard, you know, and it, uh, frankly, it's too hard to buy flicks. There's nothing we can do about it yet, but it's just complicated. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a tricky thing and it takes a certain kind of person who's already tech savvy to buy into it. And it's intimidating for people, frankly, like I said, even like me, you know, the only reason I'm involved is because I was hired by an NFT project to do the, the, the writing part, which, you know, but my experience with crypto as a, as an investor, as a consumer is like, I use the PayPal interface to buy, um, Ethereum and Bitcoin mm -hmm. because I'm a dummy who needs things to be easy. And I think the median consumer is, is, is dumb as me. Um, I might be a little bit dumber, but most people, <laughs> most people, don't, like, you know, don't sell yourself short. Uh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. But I think so that's there, one piece of it is making it very yeah. easy to buy and sell. And then the other thing is a success story that, you know, everybody wants to rally around. So mm. those are the two components. Interesting. Do you think Board Ape Yacht Club could be that? Um, I think they have a huge advantage of incumbency of being the biggest, uh, you know, NFT brand. And mm. I was actually at, or no, I, I was a friend of mine. They had a they had a pop up restaurant like their IP model of letting you own the rights to your board ape is a genius mm -hmm. innovation in mm -hmm. in IP and that points the way toward you know success but the problem is and it's the same problem I think that your your horse glue uh, guests had mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. is that like you're placing all of your bets on this one concept. Board apes. Right. Okay, maybe they are. You know, maybe they're a, a limo driver. Maybe they run a whatever. But it's like one character. And even if you mm. look at Disney, it's not just Mickey Mouse. It's Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Def, you know. There's all mm. kinds of brands and IP associated with it. And so, the the, the tricky thing about the board ape um, model is just that at the end of the day, it's apes. And there's there's mm -hmm. a ceiling to what that can do, whereas what we're asking people to invest in is a, a new mode of film finance, which is a little more dry and less sexy when you talk about it. But when you think it's like, yeah, why why don't why do we all shovel one hundred and fifty dollars a month to various cable companies and streamers and stuff without any hope of making any of that back? Like, what if you could? What if in a given year you made more money? on content than you spent on content even if it was just like a few hundred dollars it would be kind of awesome you know um mm -hmm. and that has yet to be like we, we're trying to get that message out there and thanks for having me on but like that's we see that as a great opportunity uh, yeah so we only have a few minutes left micho i hear you guys have a film festival coming up in 2023 uh, do you want to give a shout out to that tell us what that's about yeah, so we're we're uh, we're looking to um, probably later this year we'll start accepting submissions, but it's a part of like what we're trying to do with the community, which is like a have a community event where people can come together and you know mix and mingle and and feel like they're part of something, but also on a practical level, it's a great way to find new projects um, mm -hmm. and a great way to find new collaborators because you never know who's out there making cool stuff. I mean, if you look at like. You know, basically what Sundance was 30 years ago, you know, it's just like people coming together that like watching interesting movies and, um, you know, uh, so yeah, so it's, it can help us find projects 
and it can also help our, build our community. That's the plan there. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Well, Micho, thank you so much for coming on. Really insightful stuff. Love to see things about the film industry on Moon or Bust. Uh, so thanks again for coming on. I'm looking forward to following this project and seeing what you guys do. Thanks. You guys are great. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Ryan, I really have to go to the bathroom. So I think I'm going to cut it off a little bit early, uh, early today. I might just jump if you want to uh, give Let's any closing it, thoughts. Man. Let's just cut it. All right. Shout out to everybody in Zinger Nation out there in the chat. Make sure you smash the like button if you haven't already. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. I thought it was a good one. I thought the interview was great. Super interesting intersection between movie, film financing, and the blockchain. Uh, I also enjoyed that bit about altcoins, trading, going to take a look at those DeFi tokens. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Make sure to follow us both on Twitter. Links are in the description below. And last but not least, if you're still paying for trading fees on crypto, go sign up for FTX.us if you are a U.S. resident. Uh, link in the description. Link in the description down below. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We will see you on Monday. Peace.